What is up, U.S. history? All right, uh, we are getting into Eisenhower today, moving the Cold War forward. Uh, if you guys remember last time, we talked about Eisenhower winning the election in 1952 by quite a landslide. Um, he was a Republican, all right, and the previous two presidents that we've had forever, uh, FDR and Harry Truman, were both Democrats. And uh, surprisingly enough, uh, Eisenhower carries on a lot of the same policies and ideas from the previous administrations, even though they were from the you know opposing political parties. Imagine that, right? In 2020, like unbelievable. Democrats and Republicans are agreeing on things. Unreal. Okay. Uh, but anyway, uh, let's talk about the Cold War and kind of what Eisenhower had to deal with uh, when he started his presidency in 1952. First off, uh, I don't know if you want to call this a blessing, a curse, or what, but uh, remember the Cold War that we are in is predominantly with the Soviet Union. Really, it's with communism, but Soviet Union is really kind of the face of communism at this point in time. Uh, and in 1953, one year after uh, Eisenhower takes office, Joseph Stalin dies. Now, Joseph Stalin has been the one figure who has not changed the entire time uh, from the world stage on any of these issues. Um, and when Stalin dies, there's a short little power struggle, which always kind of seems to happen with Russia or the Soviet Union in this time frame. Uh, but the guy that comes out on top of that power struggle is Nikita Khrushchev, okay? Um, now, a couple things about Khrushchev, all right? Uh, nobody could be as barbaric and as unforgiving as Joseph Stalin. I mean, he was kind of the king of paranoia and killing people if he thought that they opposed him at all. Um, so Khrushchev is not like that. He's, he's not as bad as Joseph Stalin, but He's very anti-U.S. I mean, anybody in the Soviet Union is anti-U.S. at this point, and really a lot of people in the U.S. are anti-Soviet. So, um, yeah, Khrushchev, very anti-U.S., uh, not as cruel as parano or or paranoid as Stalin, but uh, still, uh, it's not going to make uh, our relationship any better is basically what I'm saying, okay? Uh, so we actually enter this time of like a peaceful coexistence, right? Like, uh, it doesn't seem to be at the brink of nuclear war anymore, um, but... Uh, Eisenhower did feel like the containment policy that Truman uh, had started where it was just like, hey, let's hold communism where it's at currently and not let it expand because of that fear of the domino theory, if you remember a couple of those terms from last uh, couple units. Um, he did expand on that, and he said during this peaceful, peaceful coexistence, um, what he wanted to do was roll back, all right, push communism back out of places it currently exists. But but here's the crazy thing with Eisenhower uh, and the amazing thing from like a, a history nerd perspective, right? Like Eisenhower's background is what? Military, right? Like he's he's the general of, you know, uh, World War II, uh, of probably the biggest fame from World War II on the United States side. And uh, he comes into office as basically the military guy, right? Like the military hero, the war hero. And uh, he very quickly sets a precedent where he is not going to send in troops uh, into these stalemates that he don't think uh, that he doesn't think can be won, right? And the first place this is uh, an example of is Korea, right? Like we had that Korean War conflict go down, and uh, before Eisenhower even took office, he went to Korea and he just kind of like you know made comments to himself that this war cannot be won. It doesn't matter how many troops that we throw at this, uh, this, this war is not going to be won by conventional means, and we're definitely not going to use atomic weapons. Uh, so Eisenhower uh, pulls out of Korea and kind of ends that conflict. So uh, this military guy comes in with this huge military background with all these military uh, accolades, and the first thing he does is say, hey, we, we are not going to further this war in Korea. We're going to get out of there. So he sets up basically a you know, peaceful coexistence is a good word for it, uh, an armistice, and uh, we, we get out of Korea. So even though he, he does say that he wants to push communism back out of places that currently exist, he is not going to use foot on on the ground military techniques to do that really through any of his eight years of presidency okay um, but uh, here's here's the other side of that uh, if he's not gonna put feet on the ground right if he's not gonna express the United States might militarily there uh, he's gonna do it through nuclear weapons and there's really two pluses to this uh, number one it, it wasn't putting people in uh, you know troops in in bad situations right and then number two is actually a lot cheaper uh, it was a lot cheaper to just build up our nuclear arsenal and uh, kind of intimidate the Soviets through that rather than, uh, you know, throwing troops into Vietnam or throwing troops into Korea, things like that. So um, the, the nuclear 
arms race is going to just blow out of proportion, you know, uh, while Eisenhower is president. And it's kind of the push to the shove uh, of, you know, not putting military people uh, on the ground in some of these places that are going through a lot of conflict. One of those places of conflict that you start to see in the in the Iron Curtain, right, those people that are controlled by the Soviets, is you start to see some pushback from Poland and Hungary. Uh, and these freedom fighters are basically, uh, you know, pushing back against the Soviet Union and the, the communist form of government. And, uh, you know, Hungary specifically pushes a little bit too far for Khrushchev's liking, and he responds brutally. So it goes to show you, is he Stalin? No. Uh, but is he going to uh, respond to some of these uprisings with the same, uh, you know, barbaric, uh, brutal mentality as Stalin did? Yeah, he can. Uh, one place that this uh, showed uh, was in the 1956 Olympics. There was this water polo match, uh, which I know, you know, water polo, you guys might not even be familiar with water polo, but, you know, this match between, um, you know, Hungary and the Soviets becomes uh, almost like a small little microcosm of the push and shove that was happening uh, at the time politically. And, uh, you know, it gets very, very physical, uh, and obviously it gets the, the name Blood in the Water match. And uh, it was just a, a small little piece of history that uh, uh, just showed a sign of the times there when the, uh, the Hungarians were trying to battle back against the Soviet oppression. Uh, here's the real big turn that takes while Eisenhower is in office, the space race, okay? And if you think of the space race, at least when I think of the space race, most of the time I think of John F. Kennedy, which is going to come after Eisenhower. But it, this started with Eisenhower for sure. In 1957, the Soviets launched the first ever satellite into space. Uh, it was called Sputnik 1. And then follow that up with uh, the Soviets uh, putting the first ever living thing into space to basically see how uh, you know, the dog would hold up because there was a lot of myths. We didn't really quite know what was going to happen if we sent living things into space. So they didn't spend a, uh, send a man up first or a woman. They sent a dog. And the first living thing that launched into outer space was uh, a dog by the Soviets. So, um, yeah, this created a lot of paranoia from the United States perspective because if they have satellites... Uh, could they be spying on us via satellites? And do we have any control in our space? No, we don't. Uh, so it kind of freaked us out quite a bit that they could have some kind of surveillance edge over the United States. And, you know, how are the Soviets coming up with this technology before we are? That was kind of the big worry, uh, especially after we had came up with the atomic bomb first and they uh, quickly followed. So now we feel like we're kind of losing that technological edge that the United States had held. Uh, and it actually leads the United States to respond by creating NASA. That is something that Eisenhower did as well. Um, so another thing that was happening at this time is, you know, just the, the normal uh, stuff that we were talking about with McCarthyism. Uh, freedom of speech takes a huge hit at this point because people literally could not speak out, uh, you know, and intelligently discuss pros and cons of communism versus capitalism. Like, yeah, I mean, we can do that now. There's several classes that do it. Comparative politics, every single university in the United States is having these discussions about, you know, the best economic theory, the best, uh, you know, political theory and things like that. It just couldn't be done. Uh, in the 60s. And this is why, because if you spoke anything against uh, the United States and capitalism, you are a communist. And uh, you saw that with McCarthyism with the last lecture that we gave. Um, you couldn't speak out. Uh, another big thing that showed uh, just how paranoid we were was The Crucible, which was a play uh, authored by Arthur Miller. And uh, he basically chronicled the Salem witch trials, but everybody quickly found out that this had a very distinct parallel uh, to, you know, uh, because in the story, right, if somebody is accused of being a witch, they're, you know, they're like burned at the stake. And the same thing was happening when people were being accused of being communists, like they were guilty until they were proven innocent, which is the exact opposite of the way that our country is founded, you know, uh, innocent until proven guilty. So uh, that was one example of it. Uh, J. Robert Oppen Oppenheimer, who uh, was one of the key people on the Manhattan Project, which came up with the first atomic bomb, founded the AEC, Atomic Energy Commission, uh, basically because, you know, he, he suffered severe mental illness and depression from his work, 
uh, you know, he becomes a huge opponent of using atomic bombs and nuclear weapons uh, and wants to actually lessen the amount of atomic weapon, weapons and nuclear uh, weapons that are made. And uh, so he finds that Atomic Energy Commission, which is still around today and still looks at around the world how we're using atomic energy, how we're using uh, nuclear warfare and things like that, and try to limit the amount of uh, nuclear weapons that countries have. So that was another thing that uh, Oppenheimer stepped out of his... Uh, you know his scientist role and tried to advocate for, and then here's the last thing I want to I want to give you with Eisenhower. Eisenhower is a, a really um, intelligent guy. Uh, I mean, like I said, he has immense accolades, especially in the military um, uh, spectrum of things. And um, you know, here's just a couple stories about Eisenhower. A couple fun facts. Uh, Eisenhower was the first and only president to be baptized while in office. And you think, yeah, Mr. Turner, why is that uh, important at all? Um, he actually came out and said very publicly uh, that the reason capitalism was better than communism and the Americans were better than the Soviets is because God is on our side. And uh, that was one thing he really believed, that uh, president shouldn't just lead from a military aspect, being the commander-in-chief, shouldn't just lead from a political aspect, being the highest political office, but also lead from a faith perspective. He's a very spiritual man. And uh, that was one thing that he felt like it was his, it was an onus on him uh, to lead through that. So uh, he's actually the one that put under God into our Pledge of Allegiance that we say every single day when we're actually at school. Um, but but anyway, uh, just a couple little tidbits there to kind of like let you understand uh, the type of leader that uh, Eisenhower was and how he saw this whole uh, thing shaking out between the uh, United States and the Soviet Union in the Cold War. Um, but, but here's what he says as he goes out the door. So he served two complete terms, eight years as president. And as he leaves, he basically gives this warning to the, uh, the American people. And once again, I want you to point out, I want to point out the irony here, right? He is a military leader through and through. That is where he got his start. That's his entire life is, is military. And he basically warns that the United States has this dangerous thing called a military industrial complex. And the military industrial complex is basically the biggest businesses in the world. And the United States military are kind of married and they both look out for one another, which that should not happen, Right. The United States government should never have like an investment in any company, yet we do with all these people that uh, you know create weapons uh, and create military uh, goods, and uh, we kind of give breaks to each other, and that that shouldn't be the role of the federal government. And it's still a huge problem that we have today, absolutely huge problem that we have today. Um, so uh, Eisenhower, you know, very thoughtful. Uh, he sees this and he, he basically says, Hey, keep this in mind. This military and industrial complex uh, is a very dangerous thing. And this was somebody who came from military background and, uh, over his eight years of president, he actually cut defense spending, um, uh, from 50.5 billion to 35.8 billion. And this is a guy, like I said, that is through and through military. So, um, it's almost like he has this this worry that he has like let this thing grow out of control, um, and he even said that he admitted it in his address, basically saying that hey, we had to do this from our perspective in the Cold War race, um, nuclear arms race, we, we had to do this. We had to build up the uh, military industrial complex. But uh, as he went out the door, he basically gave this warning that the mixing of the business sector and the military and government is a very bad thing, and we need to make sure and keep an eye on it. And rings as true today as it ever has before. So uh, that's everything for today. So uh, hopefully you guys uh, got some stuff from this and I'll see you next time.